So let's get started. Welcome back everyone from the break. It's a great pleasure to introduce our second speaker of today, Professor Christel van Steen from the University of Liège. Professor van Steen holds a PhD in mathematics from the Ghent University and also a PhD in medical sciences from the Hasselt University and Maastricht University. Since 2008, she is a professor at the University of Liège in, in Belgium. And she's also an honorary guest research professor at the Ghent University. And as all of you know, she is a valuable MLFPM partner. But Professor Van Steen is also the coordinator of another ITM network called the Translational Systemics. And Professor Van Steen is a leading expert in developing and applying methods to detect, um, first of all, gene, gene interactions, but also gene environment interaction. And she's also an expert in unifying biological and statistical evidence in genetic epidemiology. And today, she, her, focus will, her focus of the talk will be system analytic strategy in the framework of precision medicine. And with that, I would like to hand over to uh, Professor Van Steen. Thank you, Katrin, for uh, the introduction. And indeed, today I'm going to take you on a tour um, regarding systems analytic strategies in uh, precision uh, medicine. And before I give some challenges and opportunities of computational efforts for uh, precision medicine, I will briefly go over some uh, concepts related to precision medicine and systems analytics. So I will show and motivate that integration and interactions go hand in hand. And I will also motivate the role of network analytics uh, in this context. And in a second part, I will give real life examples from uh, the lab supporting this companionship uh, between interactions and um, integration. And um, I will primarily focus on um, post GWAS uh, data following uh, short courses that were given uh, last year and the year before and also uh, give examples coming from microbiome and uh, transcriptome uh, contexts. So if we want to characterize precision medicine, what is it? Well, we know it's a medical model using characterizations of individuals' phenotypes and genotypes for a multitude of uh, purposes. And it's not only about, um, or the purpose is not only disease management in the sense of post-disease diagnosis follow-up, but also about personalizing risk assessments, uh, maybe prior to disease onset, um, and delivering person-optimized uh, diagnosis. And um, what that precision medicine definition then really entails, it's that it's important to characterize an individual well. And to do so, you need data, lots of them, and ideally multifaceted, so offering multiple views on the individual. And this is challenging because data belong to an entire ecosystem of clinicians and researchers that surround that individual. Uh, and there are challenges um, on intellectual property, uh, data, computational infrastructures, et cetera. And e-health therein offers several additional challenges and opportunities for integrated precision medicine. Uh, for instance, digital therapeutics, um, and that artificial intelligence that is based on guidelines, best practices, uh, experiences of professionals, such that all the data that you collect can be translated into something useful or can increase insights or um, ameliorate uh, personalized interventions. So what can integration bring us in the context of precision medicine? Well, when data are available on lots of individuals, it can bring more precise predictions of health outcomes for an individual. And data collected over multiple individuals also allows investigating similarities and dissimilarities across individuals so that you can identify disease subgroups or groups of individuals that, for instance, would benefit more from a particular treatment regimen than others. And increasing multifaceted data are collected over time. And it's more comprehensive than just demographic, clinical, genomic, and transcriptome data alone. Uh, also entailing microbiome samples from different uh, body sites as shown in this study. 
But typically here is also that these uh, study designs are often challenging in terms of uh, integrative analysis. Huh? So for instance, in this study here shown on the, on the slide, uh, the participants' visits are a mix of planned visits, but also spontaneous visits. And the interest here was in the, was in the context of um, uh, diabetes. And you see that in these spontaneous visits, you have a mix huh, of non-pre-diabetics uh, and uh, pre-diabetic uh, individuals. So this is already challenging for the analysis, but also, of course, we're dealing with very heterogeneous data, um, where each data type basically comes with its own uh, error margins and uh, sources of uh, variation. Um, now, longitudinal data collection is particularly interesting when you want to optimize precision medicine and when the sample size is one. So only one individual. And here it can help to detect disease early or to forecast progression as the individual serves as its own internal control. And early groundbreaking experiments in this sense include the efforts of uh, Mike Snyder as in the Chen et al. Uh, paper that I show on the slide. Uh, so where multiple uh, measurements were taken over time over a period of 14 months and using an integrated approach and real-time monitoring, um, Mike Snyder could actually observe the onset of his own uh, type 2 diabetes, but he could then take actions uh, accordingly. Now, of course, heterogeneity is still present, like in the, in the previous study, but what they did was actually um, to rely on Fourier spectral analysis so that they could somehow normalize the various omics uh, data sets uh, prior to trying to uh, look for uh, common patterns. Now, um, I've mentioned um, before that, um, you know, phenotypes may be important, traits may be important, but what, what, what is an endotype? Because an endotype is something that you often hear in the context of uh, precision medicine um, as well. Well, clinicians, broadly speaking, often uh, classify patients into phenotypes, which comes from the Greek pheno, that means to show, and typos, that means a uh, type. And that's why phenotype can be defined as the observable properties of an organism that are produced by the interaction of the genotype and the environment. And the term endotype was basically introduced in 2008 by Anderson in the context of uh, asthma, if I'm not mistaken, and it's a contraction of um, endophenotype. It's a combination of the Greek word endon, meaning within, and typos that we saw before. So it's defined as a subtype of disease, defined functionally or pathologically by a particular molecular mechanism. So biological mechanism, that's the key here. And it can go beyond mechanisms, I mean, that are you know, based on, on genetics. So the goal in identifying endotypes is to really create homogeneous groups of patients that can be very interesting for uh, all sorts of clinical studies like genetic studies or maybe drug trials. And to give an example, asthma endotypes may be broadly characterized into two uh, groups, type 2 high or type 2 low um, asthma. And as you can see here uh, from this slide, it's really still an umbrella um, classification where you can underneath have different manifestations of the disease and where it's very, very difficult to try to, to get to these uh, underlying uh, biological uh, mechanisms and that are relevant uh, perhaps for precision medicine. Yet it's very important because particularly this group um, is suffering a lot. These patients have a very poor response to, to steroids that uh, together with bronchodilators are key to the treatment of uh, severe asthma. And they are also not optimal candidates for some of the newer uh, medications that are around. Um, another example is shown here on the slide. So again, uh, you have this umbrella uh, behavior. Uh, and, here, asthma is presented as a syndrome, and a syndrome is a set of symptoms that are linked to specific uh, pathogenesis, here, asthma. 
And uh, you can see uh, that it's linked to different uh, phenotypes and that uh, the phenotype comes perhaps with different endotypes. And actually you can also have an endotype that can be linked to different uh, phenotypes. So it's, it's a very complicated um, thing. So the identification of endotypes is really challenging. And I think we can make some um, advances here if we are um, investigating uh, the dynamics of these endotypes, if we um, acknowledge that um, you know, we are dealing with different systems that can be partially overlapping, and perhaps that we also spend an increasing amount of time on finding the relationships between disease endotypes and drug endotypes. Now, just as a note aside, I was looking in the literature a few days ago, um, you know, how many reviews do exist? And I was looking for integration occurring in the title and omics in the title abstract. And you see that you see this um, increase after 2012, 2014. So more data become available. People are trying to develop methods to analyze the data. And then there is an abundance of methods and you need really to have some overviews there. So it's all uh, logical what we are seeing here. But of course, not all data are equally informative and some are redundant. Yeah? And of course, the more data you collect, the more likely it will be that some items will be interrelated. So the challenge is to um, adequately describe the system of interest. And one of the basic principles of a system is that, you know, everything can be connected with everything else. And that when describing the system, you need to define some kind of a boundary within, you want to, within which you would like to be holistic in a sense. And you need to understand the behaviors of this uh, system. But in a nutshell, interactions are intrinsic properties of systems. And it's therefore also no surprise that systems blend themselves perfectly to graph representations and network analytics. So what can interactions bring us to precision medicine? Well, what we have learned from over decades of work on genetic interactions is that it's extremely difficult to align analytic modeling with biological uh, relevance or impact. And that can in part be explained by the observation that statistical interactions are based on populations, usually involve averaging out of effects, as you can see at the right. But in contrast, genetic and biological interactions occur at an individual level and are therefore natural instruments to our understanding intra and inter individual uh, heterogeneity. Now, if you look at the population level, um, I will dwell um, upon this a little bit further in the, in the next slides and then what I always call an interludium. Uh, what is the role of uh, interactions in these polygenic risk scores that you already saw uh, during one of the previous uh, summer schools in this network? Or what is the role of the environment? Yeah. So, this is here a slide on the, on the polygenic risk score. And actually this is a term that, that finds its origin in uh, animal breeding. Yeah? Um, but what the plot on the left uh, shows is basically a decrease in GWAS hit effect sizes. And um, you can actually see that the odds ratios, if you look completely at the right, uh, 2019, you see that the odds ratio is really jumping uh, underneath this cutoff so to speak, of 1.1. So basically, we are approaching more and more towards this Fisher's infinitism model. And this has some challenges, of course, because how on earth are we going to um, assess, you know, the functional relevance of such an effect, well, such a small effect to the traits of interest? However, it's, it can also be beneficial because we will have a lot of these hits now, uh, each with a very small effect. Hmm? They all contribute to uh, the polygenic risk score. The formula is on the top of this, uh, this slide. Um, and jointly, for instance, we can assess uh, whether there is an overrepresentation of pathway one or pathway two to get some further understanding about what is happening with respect to this um, disease. Yeah. Now, some people have been studying um, the incorporation of interactions into this, um, into this scheme, into this um, uh, polygenic risk score. And what you can see here is that um, if you are including interactions as well between these um, genetic markers, between these SNPs that you typically deal with in a GWAS context, you can actually improve 
um, the performance, and as you can see with the area under the, the rock curve. So if you look at the, the green line, I hope you can see my, my cursor, but um, if you look at the polygenic risk scores, uh, you see that the majority have an AU rock under uh, 60%, but as soon as you are also including interactions, you see that this performance is actually going up a lot of times over 90%. And you can very clearly see that or get in a better intuition um, with this plot here. Um, so the score that included interactions was actually based on um, model-based multifactor dimensionality reduction. This is a tool that we developed uh, in-house. But without further ado, I will just say that at the end, you will have an organization of your, of your uh, tool locus um, um, effects. Um, in the sense of whether a two locus combination is increasing or decreasing or not really important, you know, uh, for the uh, disease risk. And if you um, convert these um, high, low or redundant risks into minus one, zero or one, you can actually come up with a formula that looks very similar to the polygenic uh, risk score. And basically, if you only have main effects, even if you don't include interaction effects, but you use this alternative uh, recoding, you can already increase the performance. And obviously, if the amount of interaction effects is increasing, you also see that um, the performance um, in general uh, will be increasing. So this is actually good news, but of course we have more than uh, gene-gene interactions. We also have gene-environment um, interactions. And sometimes we also have um, interference, of course, or confounding factors to these polygenic uh, risk scores. If you would like to know a little bit more about that, I'm uh, referring you to this reference of Blank and Berg, which is really an, uh, an eye opener and uh, give some food for, for thought. So as an example uh, of uh, gene environment interactions and how this also may be very important to, um, uh, to understand disease risk, uh, I give you the example with uh, microbiome um, data. So what we see here is uh, different types of interactions that you can have between microbe and genetic uh, uh, information. So maybe host genetics may directly impact um, you know, the phenotype, and that may perhaps you know, also have uh, impact on the microbiome. But it could also be that um, host genetics is interacting actually with the microbiome and in that way regulates uh, gene expression, which then has an impact on, on the phenotype. So there are several possibilities here, and it's a challenge really to get a grip on systems like these and um, to then translate it to something useful for an individual in the context of precision medicine. Again, a note aside, I was looking for interaction reviews in combination with multiomics, and I couldn't find a lot, so I just restricted to a number of uh, publications where multiomic appeared at the title and interaction in the title and the abstract. And this is the situation then, and it's a little bit, um, um, you know, mind blowing. Only eight of these uh, publications in uh, 2020, but it actually shows that what's in an AMA of interaction. Maybe most authors are referring to it as association. For instance, between omics data sets, are they talking about omics data interacting or, or features coming from different omics type interacting or more association? Now we'll come back to that later on because that's very important. But what is systems analytics? What are the characteristics? Well, basically, in a nutshell, I would say that integration and interactions uh, go hand in, in hand. And this is here an example of the complexity and interconnectivity of omics data sources in a uh, multi-omics uh, framework. This appears to be a well-studied set of multi-omics interactions, but one can expect uh, more complex and unknown interactions while integrating multi-omics uh, data sets. So I was looking a little bit into the literature and for, for reviews on integration, focusing on multi-omics uh, integration. And really, you, you find that these reviews have their own focal points <laughs> quite often. Huh? 
So the first one was basically overlaying a few methods with targeted application context. And in this sense, I gave an overview. Or you may have review that actually focuses on how data are actually used. Others classify um, methods into early, intermediate, or late integration, or maybe um, the, the nature of the method. I mean, is it a supervised method? Is it an unsupervised, a semi-supervised algorithm that is being adopted? Um, or, you know, bottom-up and top-down um, integration where um, the definition of bottom up and top down is not always um, that clearly um, explained. And actually, I have to say for a lot of the reviews that I um, went through, there is still there are still a lot of questions that arise and where you would say, yeah, but you know, this approach, where you would you actually classify it? On? So it's it's really not so so easy to box it in. Yeah. This is the example, you know, on the, the review that um, I categorized on the basis of data use. And you can see if you compare B and A, for instance. Uh, so with B, one says, OK, you have these multiomics data sets and you first extract some data and then you do an integrative analysis. Then with the fusion methods, it's you have all your data and you immediately are doing your integration analysis. But OK. For that last approach, you probably have to be pragmatic or you do want to filter out right what is not redundant and in that way end up you know to select some features of interest. So it is not so so easy. And the same actually for the other uh, reviews and what's the difference? I mean correlation is also can also be seen as a similarity here on top of the of the slide. You know, there are Bayesian methods that are also multivariate. So why do you make that distinction? Huh? Um, it helps if you are more targeted. For instance, what is a problem that you want to solve? And that is actually more in line with um, what, you, um, um, what you would naturally do, right? You have a, a particular problem that you would like to address. You collect the data and then you find, you know, the method uh, that uh, most suits you to solve that problem, and if it is not there, you develop a method on your own. Or it can be actually data oriented. I mean, that you would like to focus on integration of non-omics with omics, yeah? It's also in this context that clinical transomics um, can, be, um, can be discussed. Or you can actually look at other uh, organisms like microbes, huh? they are also interacting huh? with the environment. You, you have host, um, 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 microbe uh, interactions. So you have metabolite mediated uh, networks. And here you already see that I'm using this network uh, paradigm. What I particularly like here is uh, this review for single cells where they basically talk um, or start from the concept of an anchor. Yeah. So either you can have it cell driven. Yeah? So the cell can be an anchor, which is called like vertical integration. Um, you can have the feature taken as an anchor, which would imply uh, horizontal integration. And what is shown here that you have no uh, anchor at all, diagonal, and where you are actually challenged with, you know, integrating this uh, orangey matrix with the, the green matrix with the, um, the, the, the bluish uh, matrix. So it uh, leaves no doubt there is a, a Tower of ba ba Babel or Babel, I'm not quite sure how you have to pronounce it in English. Uh, that we have to face, and it really depends on the community yeah, that uh, that is working on that particular uh, uh, aspect. Huh? So, for instance, multi-view, you often see that in machine learning uh, uh, papers or papers coming from the machine learning world. Multi-source is more related to you know the data types that are underlying, um, et cetera, et cetera. So we uh, decided to, to work on an, uh, a kind of, not a classification, but kind of an overview, uh, borrowing the strengths of a few of these uh, review papers and that is uh, work in progress. But for this, um, um, for the sequel of this uh, presentation, just focus on the upper right part here. And we are dealing with networks which are actually multi-layered. So for instance, think about the nodes being genes and they come perhaps from different um, omics um, uh, platforms. 
And um, with this multi-layered visualization, we can also look at interactions within each layer or between the layers. Okay, just to be sure, uh, networks consist of nodes and uh, edges, but nodes can really refer to any biological feature such as microbial taxa and gene expression, as I will show later, uh, but also environmental exposures, etc. And edges or connections between nodes can be empirically or statistically derived, or often just associations. Yeah? Um, and they can be unweighted or weighted to reflect association strength, undirected or directed to reflect cause and, uh, and effect. And then these are a few examples, and the ones that uh, we will primarily be dealing with are these multiplex uh, networks, which are shown uh, in B. Now, um, this is a very nice review where actually, you know, um, networks can go beyond pairwise interactions huh, by means of uh, hypergraphs. If you would like to learn a little bit more about that, I invite you to have a look at that uh, paper that was published in, in uh, 2020. And um, then we come, of course, to uh, the analysis of uh, these networks. And there, there is, of course, this increasing role of machine learning. I just list a few reviews here uh, where they, um, uh, indicate and explain the increasing role of machine learning in biological network analysis and more targeting deep learning and particular graph neural networks in 2021 by uh, Muzio et al. And these graph neural networks are very interesting yeah? um, because they actually act directly on, on the, the data that are represented as a graph on the graphical structure, so on these interactions as well. But there are some challenges, especially if you would like, if you're dealing with multi-layered um, networks, huh? the interaction heterogeneity is still an, um, an issue sometimes, the design of the, the GNNs themselves, and we should also not forget about the interpretation, huh? so which nodes and edges contribute uh, to the results. So these are uh, fields of uh, very active uh, research in the, in the community, I would say. Now, if you want to analyze a network, of, for, of course, first you need to have it, right? You need to construct it. So you need to select your nodes and you need to select your or construct your, your, uh, your edges. And I will show what I mean by edges in the different uh, context in, in part uh, two. Now, one way uh, to, so to construct your networks, if you have uh, measurements like, for instance, gene expression data, is to use and uh, to take one node uh, as a target and then to see which other nodes are connected with them. So which other nodes are basically predicting that target node. And that could be done, for instance, with a, uh, with a lasso technique. Um, this is actually not new, right? Lasso was used before in this sense by Meinshausen and Bullman in 2006. But we, you know, evaluated it a little bit in, in, um, in, uh, in on synthetic data and also added um, a permutation approach to really select, you know, the, the best uh, predictors um, in this, uh, uh, via these lasso uh, models. And another competitor in that, uh, in that sense is actually hierarchical uh, lasso. And this is an, an, a very interesting uh, tool as well because it does incorporate pairwise interactions to explain cases where two or more genes, uh, in my example, are expressed together and capture non-additive uh, contributions to the response. And you see it's, it's not so uh, much behind actually the, the LabNet, the tool that we developed, but you know, then you have a downplay of the, the computation time. This is typically what you see as well. You may have a very cool method, you know, to integrate data or to detect interactions or to analyze systems uh, data. But um, yeah, um, it's not feasible because it's computationally too, uh, too demanding. So there is always this pragmatic balance that unfortunately we still have to um, put. Okay, so examples. Um, Last time, so last uh, summer school, you have seen um, what GWAS are, how they are analyzed, and the post GWAS, uh, where um, GWAS outcomes were integrated uh, uh, with pathway information. 
um, a network analysis of GWAS uh, outcomes was uh, presented and also some discussions about polygenic uh, risk scores. So I'm going to take it from that point when uh, moving to um, interactions with that uh, GWAS data as a first example before moving to microbiome and uh, transcriptome data. So how to define the edges, how to construct them? <laughs> well, terminology is um, quite challenging in this, um, in this context, right? So this is a definition of Wikipedia, and I'm sure you've already read it by now. It's not really informative, I would say. It seems to be a mixture of uh, concepts. You have a lot of questions that you can ask yourself. Well, is interaction, for instance, not related to causality? Should it be related to causality? Um, uh, a kind of action, what do you really need? Okay, so let's go actually to the genetics uh, literature then. And uh, one of the definitions actually is coming from uh, Bateson, who um, you know, introduced the term compositional um, epistasis in the early 1900s, where it actually describes a situation in which the effect of a genetic factor at one locus is masked by a variant at uh, another locus. So in this case, in the example on the top, huh, you have actually that um, if you have um, at least one capital G allele at locus G, you see that it really doesn't matter what you have, you know, at B, huh, the, the color is always gray. Huh? So here we say that G is epistatic to, to B. It is not implying that B is epistatic to G. So there is non-symmetry going on, non-symmetry, sorry, going on. As soon as we go to a mathematical model, we are more working with penetrance tables, like you see at the bottom of this slide. And penetrance really refers to the probability of developing disease or the trait, uh, one zero, um, given a, um, a genotype combination. And an interesting model is actually the heterogeneity model as shown. Uh, where an uh, individual becomes affected through um, having a predisposing genotype at either locus. Yeah? So this actually corresponds to a situation in which the biological pathways that are involved in the disease are influenced by the two loci, but in a separate, in an independent way but it can also be explained as some kind of a masking. And therefore you could say that you can interpret it as epistasis as well. Um, this is just, you know, a these are just a few terms, you know, of, uh, for epistasis and each time referring to something different. So if you follow these definitions, you would actually have an other interpretation of your edge and one should be aware of that. Yeah? Uh, so mechanistic is really, you know, coupling to biology. Fisher is, is, is more closely related to like what you would do in a linear regression model, devi deviations from additivity in such a model. Statistical epistasis is what we nowadays always use for, um, you know, whenever it has been derived from a model, but actually the original definition comes from quantitative genetics where um, one really wants to see what the contribution is of epistasis, of interaction actually, to the variance of the trait. And this is perhaps one of the most clear definitions ever. Essential epistasis is when you cannot remove, you know, this, this uh, epistasis um, by changing the scale of your, um, of your outcome, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. So let's go down to the problem, right? Because this is what, what we, uh, this is the natural process, right? What is the problem that we want to solve? And the problem that we want to solve is the picture that we, we want to grasp that picture that we see on the left of the, of the slide. Uh, so where you have some interactions possible uh, between DNA sequence uh, variants that give rise to a particular phenotype, the star in the, in the slide, but it's not a direct relationship. Yeah. It goes through a hierarchy of molecular um, uh, compounds or, or uh, molecules, um, which may be physically interacting with each other. And these physical interactions are shown um, uh, with these dashed uh, lines. And it, it, you, you should remember that these type of interactions, this interplay 
is really individual, maybe individual specific. So in that context, if you understand what's going on there, it may help a lot, you know, in these contexts of precision medicine, prevention, diagnosis, or disease management that I mentioned uh, before. Um, but um, the problem is, of course, that uh, when you so want to solve the problem, you, you want to, to model it somehow, and you typically collect a lot of data and you work at a population level and there is this um, non-correspondence between one or the other as I mentioned before. So we have been traveling a long and winding road to kind of get an understanding about okay how do we approach uh, the problem even I mean when the problem is reduced to only using the genetic information, so only using the SNPs actually from the G1s, it's already a very difficult uh, problem. And um, how can we increase our belief in these discovered statistical interactions from, for instance, uh, GWAS data? And to that respect, you can always borrow a lot of information by looking a little bit outside your, uh, uh, your, your, uh, your own world uh, in which you live and operate. And the closest to, to the world uh, that I have been describing uh, a few minutes ago is actually the world of genome-wide environmental interaction studies. Uh, you have a common uh, part, which is the genetics part, uh, but there are some, some differences there, not in the least that uh, there are much more errors or potential errors associated to uh, data that are collected uh, describing uh, environmental um, aspects. Yeah? But you find the same issues with respect to terminology. When, it is, when is the interaction removable? When it is not removable? What is the impact of scaling? Are we scaling the trace? Do we find interactions? Are they, are they meaningful? Are they mechanistic? You know? This is really the same. But what you can also learn from that is that even though it was very well known already in quantitative genetics, you know, sometimes you know, people go through the maths again and make it really widely accessible to, to people. This is exactly what happened here in this, present, in this um, paper of uh, Ashar in 2016, where they actually um, you know, kind of, um, um, they, simulated, uh, they simulated a situation where there was only you know, an, uh, a pure, gene by environment interaction uh, presence. So no main gene effect, no main uh, environmental effect. And what you can see on the plot is actually the decomposition of the variance um, explained. Huh? So the outcome variance uh, is the target and how much of this variance is explained by the main effects and by the interaction. So remember, there's only an interaction, no main effects, but you see that you know the contribution of gene or or the environment can be really substantial, yeah, and that is because that parameter, this beta GE, uh, so capturing the effect of the gene environment interaction, is really occurring in the formulas of the the, the variance explained by the the, the singular um, effects, yeah. And this has been this has been taken as an argument. Okay, why should we actually look at interactions? Because you know, it's the you know the main effects really you know that that are that are the most important. But it really depends on the problem that you would like to solve, right? Here the focus is on prediction. Here the focus is on on you know risk assessment. You know. Um, uh, you, you would like to, to have uh, maybe some impact on policy changes here, risk prevention, and these type of things. Whereas in the GWAS, actually the primary focus is often to just understand, well, not just, to understand molecular mechanisms, you know? And there, it is, there is still a lot of room to deal with uh, interactions. Okay. So, um, and of course, what I'm telling here, you can extrapolate to the larger context as well when you're bringing in multi-omics uh, um, into the picture as well. But the other thing is that we need to make decisions about the unit of analysis. You can take SNPs, you can take sets of SNPs, sets of SNPs, for instance, that are linked to a gene. Uh, so all the, all, like in the first, um, the, the first line here on the, on the slide, or you can actually, um, you know, 
get some more graphical structure in that uh, set by looking at the, the non-independence of those genes, so which we call LD, if you remember from, from last time, linkage disequilibrium. Um, or you can even bring a third, uh, a third data um, type into the picture, maybe gene expression data, and you can look at you know, the EQTL. So you can look at the SNPs that are impacting the gene, uh, that gene's expression, which may come actually from the quite different locations and uh, maybe their modifiers. And in that way, um, represent a gene by a SNP set that you depict as a graph. And then you can start uh, doing some cool things with it because you can define a question for a graph. You can define a kernel on that graph. You can actually do a kernel PCA to cluster and to have similarities between your uh, individuals on the basis of that, uh, of that uh, gene with that particular uh, graphical structure. And that, of course, uh, may facilitate the analysis because you reduce dimensionality reduction. Maybe it also enhances the interpretation and it's also believed to um, increase replication. So in this case, your node would be, you know, a gene, but really comprising a lot of information underneath it. And this really paves the way for some, some extras as well, because sometimes you do not have uh, other data than your SNP data, and you can still create very interesting uh, inter interaction networks between a gene, you know, um, upon which you can def define your graph kernel by looking at, for instance, a synergy um, using some um, um, algorithms to select a, the, uh, the most important uh, nodes, for instance, maximum uh, relevance and, and minimum redundancy algorithms. And then, you know, uh, with uh, the kernel PCs, put them into the models for whatever you would like to do. To end this uh, example, I would uh, just like to highlight another important uh, challenge, in my opinion, and that is, of course, reproducibility, where methods and results reproducibility are, um, you know, they should really be, be standard, but where we also spend quite a lot of time, uh, if not like, uh, you know, 60 or 70% of our time on inferential reproducibility, where that really refers to, okay, understanding why a conclusion cannot be um, reproduced, yeah? And we focus on conclusions because it's that, you know, that is potentially get having an impact on, on society or an impact for, for medical purposes, right? So it's that con conclusion that should be consistent. And if we don't have it, why is that? Is it because, you know, our new data set was too different, you know, from the one that we initially used? Or is it because of the method that is being used? What is going on? And going through these processes, uh, really enables you to, to better capture, you know, uh, the data and what you can do with it. Yeah? And uh, so one of the things is if you have these, um, um, to stay in that context, epistasis networks, you, um, whatever method you, if you take different methods, uh, regression, uh, an, um, an, um, a neural network, a, a random forest, I can guarantee you, you know, the results when represented as a network, will look quite different, yeah? So what do you do next, you know? Well, you would like to have one conclusion or a few conclusions, and in this context is that we were looking into some novel uh, network aggregation uh, methods. Huh? So this is the work of, of uh, Diane in the group who estimated, who generated, sorry, some partial networks huh, that uh, reflect partial views of of a so-called true underlying network, mimicking actually that real life uh, example. And then, um, you know, trying to see, okay, how can we get an aggregated uh, conclusion? So one network with um, uh, predicted uh, links. And she did so by having the solutions um, um, organized in columns of that matrix to the left and the edges, uh, as, uh, as rows. And basically you have a matrix of ones and zeros, ones when an edge was found, 
found in that particular solution with that method, with that protocol, uh, et cetera. And then you can do a cluster analysis or different types of clusters analysis on these edges. And you also expect uh, that the biggest group will be the group where there are no edges. Yeah? And um, this is then a way to come up with one solution um, where you can then um, you know, do follow-up analysis and see whether some edges are uh, more linking to particular pathways or uh, not. But of course, we are using here, um, we are generating one um, aggregate network. And this may not be that um, clever, yeah, because some methodologies may give rise to so different results that it may not be that wise, you know, to lump it all together. Um, so here we run into that concept of network similarity and how to um, how to define it in a in a proper way. Um, and there is this very nice paper of uh, Tandardini at all. This is a review uh, which we actually took as a, as a starting point uh, a few years ago uh, to think about uh, these problems, huh? where they really divide these. Um, uh, methodologies into no node correspondence methods, for instance, like a delta con method, or the unknown node correspondence methods, like, for instance, the spectral uh, methods. We are uh, in the situation of a no node correspondence methods, right? So we have the nodes will always be the same, but the edges will be will be different depending on the view, depending on the method that we use, etc. So a multiplex network. And this is then challenging because if you look into uh, multi-layered network analysis and similarities there, um, th there seems to be a tower of Babel as well, you know, in, in uh, similarity measures and depending on the community, you know, how something is called. And in, I like this paper here because here they make at least an attempt to look at some relationships between, you know, these measures that are circulating and coming from different uh, works. And they also try um, to give some guidelines about how to choose appropriate measures given a specific data set. And they do that with the so-called uh, property matrix. So let us go to a second uh, example. Enough about uh, interactions. Let's move to uh, microbiome um, data. And um, well, microbiomes are increasingly a part of health-related studies because for instance, host microbiome interactions have already shown to be um, highlighting very interesting targets for new diagnostics and um, therapeutics. And the data that we had was data from the lucky cohort study. So it's an ongoing cohort embedded within the, the, the larger lucky cohort study where participants were enrolled in the South Limburg area via uh, professionals. Uh, but also via the internet. And currently uh, there are about 140 newborns and their parents in the uh, enrolled. And then there is a microbiome uh, profiling done by next generation sequencing of 16S, uh, V3, V4 hypervariable gene regions. Variants were identified with an uh, old uh, pipeline. And then uh, centered log ratio transformations were done on the data to, to normalize um, the data. Now, these terms may, may sound a little bit strange to you, especially if you have not been working with microbiome data before. So let us go a little bit into more detail what the nature of the data um, are. And um, so, um, 16S sequencing, why is that being done or why does it uh, refer to? Well, we're actually looking at the 16S rRNA gene. Yeah? And this is actually a genetic marker that is very useful to identify or classify uh, microbes. Yeah? And why is that? Because it consists of highly conserved and hypervariable regions with which are denoted by V1, V9. So that explains already one part on the, on the previous slides. And then what you get out after such a sequencing is sequencing reads. So these are strings of DNA sequence, and then these can be analyzed with an, a bioinformatics uh, pipeline. 
What is also important in this context is the notion of OTU that you see at the bottom of the, of the figure. And this stands for operational taxonomic uh, unit. So basically that's an operational definition that is used to classify uh, microbes based on sequence uh, similarity on that, uh, on that marker uh, gene. So what are some problems with microbiome data? What makes them so interesting from a model developer's uh, point of view? Well, actually there are three potential biases there. And the first bias is that um, microbiome data are compositional in nature. So for every individual, you will have a vector of positive real numbers, yeah? And non negative real numbers. Um, these are the counts, yeah? The abundances, yeah? So every element refers to an operational taxonomic unit and how abundant is that uh, for that uh, individual. And the sum is constrained because the sum is determined by, uh, you know, your sequencing uh, depth, yeah? uh, the number of reads. So it means that basically you're dealing with an equivalence class. Yeah? And the, the vector that, that I just described is one representative of that equivalence class. Another unique representative is actually, you know, living on a unit simplex. So we're dealing then with proportions. And if you sum them, they sum up to one. Yeah. So there is a difference between these absolute abundances or relative abundances. We should actually work with relative abundances if we want to compare individuals with each other. This is called the compositionality problem or the compositionality bias. And you will hear that over and over again. And this is one of the most challenging um, aspects. You know, also to integrate machine learning into, um, into the microbiome world. So, for instance, this centered um, log ratio transformation is one way to deal with compositionality, but there are other transformations possible as well. And not all of these transformations are giving equal, uh, you know, equal, comparable performance if you integrate them with uh, machine learning tools like Random Forest and there is really not so much research done when you integrate it with um, neural network uh, paradigms. The other one is sparsity. So you have a lot of microbes that are not occurring, which could be true, but it could also be because you don't have enough sequencing depth. And of course, again, uh, confounders, spurious associations, uh, where an edge between two uh, taxa may actually be um, false. Yeah, and this, of course, is also something you would like to avoid because, um, yeah, if you want to do analysis on the network and you can't trust uh, the edge, that's not so good. This then leads to um, the, the fact that you have to, most of the time, adapt standard approaches in the context of um, uh, this compositional data, like microbiome data. I've already mentioned the centered log uh, ratio transformation, which is basically this log of your uh, count divided by a reference, which is a geometric uh, mean of the vector. Um, so you define a new distance, and this distance and, and this way of dealing with compositional, with the compositionality of the data is called a coda analysis, a compositional data analysis. And there are some uh, key features actually of such an analysis that is that it needs to be scale invariant. And so it really does not matter which um, element you, you consider from the equivalence class, it should give the same results. Permutation uh, invariance, it doesn't matter how you organize, how you order these uh, taxons or these microbes. And subcompositional coherence, very important because you want to do some feature selection and you don't want that, um, you know, suddenly your, uh, your conclusions on those same microbes are going to, to change. Okay, so now let us look at uh, real data uh, analysis results. So um, what we have here on the, on the plot to the left is basically within subject uh, distance in microbiota structure between two subsequent uh, time points. Yeah? So we had all these babies, it's microbiome data on the babies. We use the correct distance, the HSN's uh, distance, 
and then uh, we look at these box plots and you see that there is a shift you know if you go from month six to month nine how could we potentially interpret this so this was done by our colleagues in in maastricht by the way well because the diet changes a lot uh, around that time you know between six and uh, nine months and this is also reflected in this um, difference in a microbiome uh, constitution. Now, what you typically do with these uh, data is then to try to cluster the individuals on the basis of their microbiome compositions. And um, a very uh, popular technique there is Dirichlet multinomial mixture cluster. And this is what you see at the panel to the uh, right, yeah? these uh, different uh, ellipses. Yeah? These are the different uh, groups. And then you can start doing some transition analysis huh, to see, okay, do people stay in the same group, in the first group or in the second group? Yeah? And you again see that actually, if you transit from month six to month nine, that most of the kids are changing their group, which is actually called in this community enterotypes, and um, with the exception of um, some kids in, uh, in this uh, group too. So, this is really, these are really interesting time points to consider. So we considered these two time points and we were looking at, okay, how can we construct um, um, the edges? And there is really a lot of material there, advanced methods, modeling conditional dependence. I give some examples below. In the Machado reference uh, review, um, magma was not yet included, but this is also, I think, a very promising uh, tool to, to construct the edges. But most people are still relying on some notion of uh, correlation. Yeah? It's easy to understand. Um, but from all the methods that were listed in the review and that are correlation based, there are basically only two um, that also handle the compositionality uh, bias. Yeah? And CC Lassa was basically uh, constructed for instance, also to speed up the process because sparse CC is very computationally intensive, but that argument is now no longer valid because these days we also have the fast SPAR, which is basically sparse CC, but with a fast uh, the implementation. So the results that I show will be based on a fast SPAR. But to just you know, indicate to you how careful you have to be, and that you just can't um, use the classical measures, this uh, Pearson uh, measure, for instance, have a look at uh, this plot. So you see all these edges, huh? uh, there are uh, positive and there are negative uh, correlations. The negative correlations are in red, which are logical because if the abundance of one microbe increases because of this sum constraint, the others must go down, right? So you will have a lot of these negative correlations, red ones. And you see that for this microbe or this taxon tree, which is highly abundant in the data, you see you have a lot of these negative uh, associations. And you could start making interpretations you know, from these, but it may not be such a good idea. Um, because if you look at the middle panel, these are reshuffled data. So you kept actually the marginal uh, abundances, but you have um, um, no associations between the, between the microbes anymore. So you see that a lot of these red edges at the left are also appearing in the middle. So basically these are spurious associations. Yeah? And you see that a lot of those are gone in the SPAR CC. So just by following the principles of this CODA uh, analysis. Yeah? And on top of it, you see that, you know, some of the negative correlations may reveal, and one of uh, those negative correlations is shown at the right between three and 148. It was completely blurred, you know, it didn't show up in the Pearson uh, analysis. So one association measure is not the other. You have to think very carefully, you know, how to define uh, your edge, how to construct the edge, because if you're doing your analysis on the network and drawing conclusions from that, it's of utmost importance. And this is then how a global network may look like at month six or at month nine reduced because otherwise you wouldn't see anything anymore. So we made some reduction uh, by having a threshold on the, on, the, uh, on the correlations 
And typically in this field, one takes 0.4 or 0.5, yeah? Um, now, so far I have been talking about uh, global networks. I've been talking about networks that have been um, um, constructed by uh, pooling lots of individuals uh, together. And the weights were population-based um, estimates. Now, individual-specific um, interaction networks are also networks with nodes and uh, edges, but specific to an individual. And if you look in the literature for these individual-specific networks, then they um, are typically dealing with multiple measurements for the same individual, um, the individual serving as its own control. And in these scenarios, quite often coming from neurosciences, you will see, you will actually have not so much problem in constructing a network. It's quite similar as if you were dealing with lots of individuals and pooling across those individuals. Now, networks can also be made individual specific in the presence of a fixed template, yeah? Uh, like a protein-protein interaction template, for instance. You, you take that fixed for all the individuals, but you superimpose individual specific nodes. Well, these you know, sends are also individual specific, but it's not the ones that we are interested in. These are, by the way, um, networks that are used post GWAS analysis, as you also saw um, in the previous uh, summer school. So what are we then interested in? Well, we are interested in networks where the edges, the edge weights are individual uh, specific. And how do we get to that? Well, uh, it's colleagues in, in Harvard who suggested one uh, possibility and their formula, which, you, which is shown on the, on the slide, is built on repetitively leaving out one individual of the total sample and then capturing the influence this procedure has on the edge weights. And then you reconstruct the individual specific edge weight such that in the event of infinitely large samples, on average, the population results are retrieved. And one of my students, Federico Melograna, is working out different recipes, machineries, if you like, to go from influence or perturbation to individual specific association strength and also assessing joint significance of uh, network edges. Now, I don't have to um, say that, uh, you know, how potentially important this can be to have these individual specific networks. Think back of, of um, the, the mini systems or the systems that I showed uh, quite in the beginning of this, um, of this lecture. Uh, so all kinds of interactions that are happening uh, at an individual level, edges that are happening, you know, that are appearing at an individual level. So trying to construct this is, is uh, challenging, but it can also be very rewarding. Yeah, because you can actually draw interpretations directly from the network that is coupled to that individual, rather than deriving it from you know, a population-based aggregated network and then deducing it, you know, to uh, the individual level. And one way of making sense of these networks is by looking at, for instance, modules. And here, unfortunately, um, we see that, you know, the, the, the validity or, or validating, sorry, validating the quality of a community from a real network is not receiving that much of attention. And that is, probably because it is also not so clear what good means huh? and, and good, what is good in one context may be bad in another context uh, as well. Now, this is uh, food for thought for, for another lecture. So before we go into some uh, opportunities, let's make sure that we're all on the same page. Huh? So basically, we are now dealing with um, um, multiple measurements for an individual but related to an edge in a network rather than a node in the network. But the data organization is pretty similar. So it means that a lot of the methods that you would be using um, ordinarily on the nodes can now be uh, used on edges as well. Um, and you can actually you know, look at, you can use one of these methods, which is basically uh, perhaps an, an, a moderated t-test. Huh? to compare the mean of edges between two time points, one edge at a time, 
and to look at the top 50 of these differential uh, edges and then use that as a filtering approach to then revisit you know, your network at a global network at um, the time point of interest. This is what's happening at the left. yeah, And at the right, that was what was shown uh, before. So in this way, with, with different selections of uh, edges, different filtrations in a way, you can um, get a different view, you can get uh, different understandings out of it. Okay, so what are now um, additional opportunities? Well, um, distinguishing between stable and unstable individuals across conditions based on individual specific networks can clearly further contribute to precision medicine optimizations. And to make such distinctions in systemics analytics way, we use individual specific neighborhoods. So what we do in particular was we performed a network representation learning to map an individual's binarized multiplex network to a low dimensional coordinate space using an encoder decoder neural network. So what you see there on top of the, of the plot are these is this multiplex network with green nodes and, and blue nodes. So the blue nodes is, is actually an individual specific network related to time point one. And the green network is a network for that same individual, right? Individual specific, but for time point two. So what we basically do is the inputs and outputs are binary vectors that correspond to each uh, node in the multiplex network for a single individual. And the, um, at the uh, encoder side, we use the information about immediate distance, distance one, to create the input factor. And at the decoder side, what needs to be predicted is a binary representation of more distant neighbors, so likely to be reached by a random walker. And then the local structure that is learned of this multiplex uh, network lives in this low dimensional space in which you can then do further analysis, such as like looking at the angle between these uh, two nodes. So basically your data is organized as such uh, so that now instead of the edge weights, the node weights, you have this angle or the cosine uh, of a, a cosine similarity or a distance between the nodes. Uh. So for every pair of nodes, you will have such an, uh, so, sorry, for every node, yeah, you will have such an, uh, an, an angle uh, when you compare it to the situation at the other time point. And you can start clustering individuals on the basis of that. And if you do that, you find uh, on our data two clusters, yeah? cluster one and cluster two. And if you then look at the most and the least variable microbes in terms of their local neighborhood dynamics between the two time points, um, you can get the, the plot uh, to the right. So you see that there are actually only three film uh, involved here. If you look at the most extreme uh, situations and then there is even one setting. So um, for clusters, I don't see it because I see the, the pictures, okay? So for cluster uh, one and the least uh, dynamic um, uh, microbes in terms of their local neighborhood, they really have a very pure ancestry. That's that blue line that you can see here going all the way over the classifications like order, class, and uh, film. Now, the second opportunity lies in the fact that we still want to cluster individuals with respect to these individual specific networks, but um, you know, where we don't have uh, repeated uh, measures, we don't have time porous data. And um, here actually, um, we also developed an, uh, an algorithm that uh, once you have chosen your similarity matrix between the networks and done your hierarchical clustering, you can actually um, borrow some information from ecology to implement a distance-based um, ANOVA. So instead of actually comparing nodes to an average, you are looking at all pairwise uh, combinations in such a uh, framework. This allows you to actually put a, a p-value to the branching off and basically gives you a strategy to determine the most optimal number of um, of clusters or where you take the cutoff in this uh, dendrogram. So when you apply it to these data, you have actually two clusters, one at time point six and one at time point nine. 
and uh, uh, sorry, 10 uh, groups at uh, month six and eight groups at uh, month nine. They can also be shown to be quite different from you know, the standard approach and this Dirichlet multinomial mixture model. But then you can start looking at also transitions uh, to see uh, in this case that uh, basically all transitions occur in uh, either this upper uh, left part or the, the bottom uh, right part of, um, of the plot. You can also look at um, you know, how good that clustering is and whether you have some misclassifications as is being uh, illustrated here in this instance uh, where you have a negative uh, silhouette uh, value, but roughly speaking, it does very well. What we are interested in actually is uh, what are the main drivers of these clusters? So for instance, in month nine, where we had eight subgroups, you can actually look at these edges separately and you feed them into a uh, predictor approach here. It was just a simple conditional tree that we that we use because it gives such a nice uh, visualization. And uh, you see that a few edges are really uh, selected here with their uh, corresponding thresholds uh, to kind of differentiate between uh, the eight uh, uh, subgroups that we are detected. And these are now carried uh, forward for uh, further analysis. Um, but it is clear that you know the the uh, the impact of selection can be quite um, uh, dramatic in both ways, you know, in a positive way or in a negative way. And this is shown, for instance, here in this case of mode of delivery, um, where we first use the prioritization on the um, individual specific edges with an uh, algorithm called uh, relief. So it does use actually it's it's quite sensitive to to interaction information. And then we plugged it into the random forest prediction model down sampling to ensure similar number of observations in mode of delivery classes. And by doing so, then we got you know, higher and higher areas under the curve. So discrimination performance. Of course, here, what we are also looking at or what one should be looking at, uh, and this is a network on machine learning, is uh, network representation learning. So we have been looking into the literature and this will obviously be our, uh, our next uh, steps. Huh? So this is one um, method MXGNN uh, that was introduced in, uh, by Liang and co-authors. It was recently published and with rather good performance. And if you can see here, the number of graphs can be quite uh, bigger, which we also have in our sample, right? Because for every individual, we have a graph. So what can these uh, methods bring us? Uh, what can these bring us to classify, to group uh, perhaps these, uh, these graphs? Um, and, and can it backwards uh, uh, learn us more about you know, the impact of uh, certain choices made all along from the pure data towards uh, the end? So in summary here, um, the edges, um, either we can have an, an, we can start making interpretations uh, by looking at the edges uh, uh, at every individual, um, on an individual basis and try to link it to clinical data. And here, yeah, by doing so, we could get uh, acceptable discrimination performance, but it's really, you know, a matter of how you selected the edges, you know, where you threshold. And of course, you may have good discrimination performance, but it doesn't mean that also you have well uh, a good calibration. If you work it with the network as a whole, huh, um, or the larger uh, a larger group of uh, of edges uh, going beyond modules, um, we can't find significance. So. Um, Maybe that is because, yeah, you, you have so many choices actually for the kernel and they all look at very particular aspects of these networks. And it is a challenge to find, you know, those aspects that can be most informative, right, for the problem that you would like to solve. And here in this context, of course, network representation learning may be um, a very useful um, as well. But the common denominator is basically sparsification. And I will come back to that later on in a very short part on the, the transcriptome data. This is also unpublished. Um, but we see that um, you know, gene expression data are routinely used to identify genes that on average exhibit different expression levels between, for instance, a case group and an, uh, a control uh, group. 
but um, this does not mean that the same genes are also perturbed in a single case individual. Because what we often see is that there is fairly little overlap between case subjects on the basis of their personalized perturbation profiles. Um, I have had indeed a few um, additional slides and I'm, I think that the slides will be shared as well. And they give you um, um, some more background actually why or why not we shouldn't um, use same principles with microbiome data for transcriptome data. So I like this publication a lot, Quinn et al. 2019, who actually try to use or discuss, you know, some of this uh, compositionality issues in the context of transcriptome uh, data. But the challenge that we are really here dealing with is how does this molecular heterogeneity then between the case subjects translate into precision medicine uh, practices? And the way Mencha does it is they have this fixed template, right? So the edges are not individual specific, but you have, you know, some scores that are individual specific. And if you restrict attention to a pathway, and this is indicated by these dashed um, uh, lines at the bottom of the slide, you can really see that you know, maybe at a pathway level and with these individual scores and using the fixed uh, edges, you can still see some heterogeneity between individuals. But we would like to actually make use of the individual specific uh, edges. And um, so how are we um, um, doing that in practice? So we look for um, node similarities or modules in the aggregate network that are obtained from all the individuals. No? It's here called aggregate network. No? And one of these modules is highlighted in yellow, this, this part here. No? And it's a zone. It's a zone that consists of nodes and connections and edges between them. And for each such zone in this aggregate network, we now would like to see whether the yellow zones in the individual specific network, so going down the figure, maximizes or minimizes individual to individual heterogeneity. So how do we do that? By first selecting a similarity metric again, right, between two individual specific networks, but restricted to uh, the, the networks in the, in the yellow zones. And that leads then to an individual similarity network as grown in, uh, as shown in, uh, in gray. Uh, so the gray network, the nodes there are individuals. Yeah? And what we then would like to see is, okay, is this a very connected network or do we see some subgroups there? Yeah? So a measure that we are using there is um, the Fiedler value. Yeah? So we use this algebraic connectivity in this individual similarity network to identify groups of individuals uh, that you show here in that uh, gray network, three groups, light gray, darker gray, and very dark gray. So if we apply this to our real life data, this is what you get. Huh? So you get these hot zones in red, and in the hot zones, you see that there are two groups distinguishable. So a little lighter red and a little darker red. And then the, the blue, uh, um, so the cold zones, are depicted in the in the um, in the bottom part of the slides, and you really don't see a clear separation uh, between the individuals. Huh? So a cold zone is a zone that does not indicate evidence of heterogeneity between individuals. Huh? So this matches high connectivity in the individual to individual similarity network for that zone. And the hot zone, well, that has potential consequences, right? Because there, these functional interpretations based on the all sample aggregate network may need to be refined or at least diversified uh, to some subgroups of uh, individuals. So this is getting more and more towards personalized medicine. And these uh, different zones that you get, the different hot zones, because there are multiple hot zones that you can detect in that way, prioritized by uh, modular structure in the aggregate network, they really offer different views as is depicted on this, um, on this uh, slide. And last but not least, um, of course, you can also look at, uh, you can also look beyond huh, uh, 
um, the spectral uh, picture of a, of a graph. And in that sense, um, I would like to mention this uh, graph uh, filtration um, a notion. Yeah? So when you have a graph with an edge weight function uh, that goes from the edge set to R, a filtration is really a series of monotone increasing subgraphs that defines a graph decomposition. And you can actually take, you know, as a weight function in a naive way, the edge weights themselves. Yeah? So whenever you take a threshold, you can look at, okay, how many edges are still remaining in the network. And in this way, um, have this monotone increasing um, subgraphs uh, um, series as depicted on the, on the slide. And what you can then do is actually with a graph descriptor function, which is um, um, focusing on particular attributes of the graph, depict that graph in a different way. So this was very nicely um, described and explained in an, uh, a publication of um, Leslie Aubrey um, from uh, Carson's lab. Um, so we actually applied this as well on, uh, on our data. Uh, so the two hot zones that we, um, that we uh, obtained uh, or that I showed uh, before. And if you then average uh, these filtration curves, but here we took as an, um, on the y-axis, um, not only no degree, but also the feeler value, you can clearly see the separation between these, uh, between these two groups. And then it is a challenge, of course, to actually put a key value of this, and this is work in progress, where we are actually looking at some normalizations of this filtration curve and extending Euclidean distance from point data to distribution data amongst others. But you can then also look at all these curves that you obtain for every individual. And again, apply the distance-based ANOVA that I showed before to really um, see how uh, our individual are clustering into a homogeneous uh, group. So, and with this, I would like to end with some uh, take home uh, messages so that there is still some time for, for questions. So integration and interaction need to go hand in hand. Uh, precision medicine benefits from longitudinal follow-up, but new avenues for machine learning should not be left unwalked. Uh, novel developments are, I think, still welcome in the context of uh, multiplex network analysis or multi-layered network analysis. Individual specific networks are promising uh, uh, in the context of precision medicine and individual heterogeneity assessment and uh, hopefully can further complicate uh, complement sorry, standard analysis. And then um, an additional challenge is actually how to determine causality or bring causality into the picture or uh, directionality in these individual specific networks. So thank you for your attention. And um, I put up a slide with our um, European funding agency. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Crystal. Very exciting and very informative. I learned a lot. Um, are there any questions from the students? Let me check Slido. There's no question in Slido. Okay, so while they're preparing their question, I'm going to ask one. And um, I was wondering, so with the microbiome data, like how large are your data sets? Because as far as I understood, the microbiome like is so variable across different people, different uh, diseases, and then you have drugs and nutrition. And I always wonder like how, like how large are your data sets you work with? And how large has a data set to be in order to uh, to um, apply the methods you actually presented? Yeah, there should actually be a question for uh, those who are handling the data on a day-to-day -day basis. But actually, you know, in principle, any microbe that exists in the world are, um, I mean, we are not working with microbes in the environment. So basically we're working with the uh, gut microbiome or microbes in the in the stool etc but i mean if you look at the diversity in general you know in the stool these are all elements in the factor that you have for every individual yeah potentially 
but not everything is observed because of the sparsity, right? And because of the sequencing depth, et cetera. But it can become quite large. And you may not have the power actually to make conclusions at you know, um, um, you know, the microbe level. So that's why we have these operational taxonomic units to make it more uh, tangible, yeah. Mm -hmm. Good, are there any questions? Uh, yeah, there's a hand raised. Uh, Giovanni, please. Thank you for your talk. It's really fascinating. I have a quick question. I apologize if it's something that I missed, but I wanted to ask out of curiosity. You mentioned quite a bit um, multi-layer networks, uh, multiplex models with networks, but do you also include heterogeneous networks? Because I, I found that it is quite a challenge to include certain type of biological networks like pathways. Yeah, yeah. I haven't shown it here, right? Because we are actually not uh, doing it uh, right now, but yeah, it's it's where we need to move to, right? If we are uh, integrating different uh, uh, data sources, yeah, especially coming from the environment, that's what I'm what I would be looking at uh, first, you know, so environmental exposures and putting them into you know into that uh, context and how they may impact you know certain elements. Yeah? But that's why we were, were so we come actually from the from the GWAS field, right? Uh, and um, integrating multiple uh, omics on the same individual and i see you know microbe as as you know a, a very interesting playground on its own but also you know interacting with you know these host omics and i think there is where you get to these uh, heterogeneous uh, networks and if you make some um breakthroughs there it will probably also be useful for a more generic context right on uh, heterogeneous networks does that answer your question? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Great. Are there any other questions? Burning questions? Um. So basically, the nutshell is if you do network analysis, you need to select your nodes uh, properly. You need to spend quite some time on, you know, what do you really want to capture with an edge? And once you know that, there are still a multitude of options to actually construct it. And the construction methods may really, um, uh, well, they have to be driven by the nature of the data, as I've shown with the microbiome data, right? So which are compositional uh, in nature. And then, you know, once you have done that, you can actually start analyzing your data, and that is where then these individual specific networks may offer some, uh, you know, alternative perspective. Mm -hmm. Good. So on that note, if there are no further questions, I don't see any hands raised. Um, thanks again, Crystal, for this fantastic talk. You also get a virtual round of applause. <laughs> And uh, with that, uh, we're going to close the morning session and we will reconvene at 1.30 for the afternoon session. Thanks a lot, everyone, and have a good lunch.